Welcome to Cloudy with a Chance of Trust, a podcast for digital transformation leaders where we discuss the latest cyber attack issues, enterprise security strategies, and current security events so that you can successfully accelerate network and security transformation. And now here's what's on our mind this week. Welcome back everybody for another episode of Cloud of the Chance of Trust. I really do appreciate you joining us today. If you are a common listener to our podcast, you'll know that this is the first one that Lisa won't be with us, but that's okay. We know that she is climbing rocks and hiking and doing living life to the fullest right now. So so to go ahead and kind of make our transition, I actually invited one of my peers here at Zscaler, Brad Molnir. He's one of our field CISOs to join me as a co-host. And we are going to welcome a very special guest today. We are so excited to have Dr. Ron Ross with us. First of all, let me first say thank you so much um, for your service to our country through not only your long military career, but then aiding and defining really how to categorize and, and safeguard information assets for not only the federal government where it started, but then being adopted by so many private industries. Um, you know, for those of you who may not know, um, Dr. Ross is, is a fellow at the National Institute of Standards, most of us know it as NIST, right? And I was so surprised to find out that I didn't realize it was originally founded in 1901 as the National Bureau of Standards, which then became NIST in 1988. Dr. Ross, thank you so much for joining us. Could you just give us a bit of your background that I, because I did not do you justice. Well, thanks so much, Pam and, and Brad, for, for hosting this today and to Zscaler. Very much appreciated. As I, we were talking about earlier, it's one of my, mo- my favorite things to do is to interacting with our industry partners. Um, you're right. And this goes back a long, long way to the National Bureau of Standards. Uh, we've been since 1901 renamed the National Institute of Standards and Technology in 1988. And in fact, uh, our cybersecurity history goes back, we we're just celebrating our 50th anniversary. So NIST has been around a long time. Uh, our division at NIST, we have two cybersecurity divisions and they've been doing work in cybersecurity for, as I said, 50 years. So um, it's just great to be here today. I'm always excited to talk about cybersecurity. I think, uh, as you said, my, my background, I, I've been going at this a long time. I, I know um, I just had my 71st birthday a, a few months ago, and, and I'm still loving the job, loving the, the mission, and loving the people that I work with, and just um, every day getting up and trying to make this a little bit more secure country, a more secure world, and, and the things that we do uh, to work together to achieve that uh, that goal, that objective, I think is is critically important. Um, I did serve uh, over 21 years in, in the United States Army. Uh, I came after a short four-year period in the private sector. I came to NIST. I think it's going to be my 25th anniversary next month at NIST. So the time really goes by very quickly. And I know we're going to be talking a little bit later today about the history of some of the things that we started at NIST uh, decades ago where our whole business has come uh, up to this point and how maybe the things that industry is doing to support the cybersecurity mission is going to really help uh, get to where we want to go long term. So again, thank you so much for having me here today. And I'm looking forward to the, to the chat. Yeah, yeah, definitely, Ron. And, you know, uh, on that point, I think we can pick it up right there. I mean, yeah, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I mentioned to you when we were planning for this that, um, you know, the first part of my professional career was spent, um, you know, supporting the public sector. And, you know, I kind of stumbled my way into what at that point in time was the the Gizra, Gizra uh, yeah, you know, regulation. And then ultimately, right a uh, few years into it, you know, FISMA was introduced. And I think, um, I think that there is a legion of cybersecurity professionals today that you have heavily influenced and really helped them learn their craft via the guidance you have devoted a large portion of your career to, you know, specifically the 837 risk management framework and the 853 security control catalog. Can you talk about the early days around the development of those special publications, given that FISMA mandate? Absolutely. That's a, it's a great question, uh, Brad. I, I think when I got to NIST in 1997, all the work that we were focused on pretty much at that time, encryption technology, the FIPS 140 program was big back then. 
And the common criteria, a lot of people don't remember the common criteria. It's ISO 15408, really the first extensive international cybersecurity standard that talked about security requirements and security assurance. But that took up a lot of our time during the late 1990s, moving into 2000. Then we had 9-11, and our focus on security was renewed at that point uh, to a heightened state. Uh, FISMA came along in uh, 2003. Actually, it was written in 2002, mm -hmm. signed by President Bush in 2003. And at that time at NIST, my colleague, Marianne Swanson, had been working on a, a questionnaire. Uh, it was the 800-26 publication. And it had around, I think, a dozen maybe or so families of, of questions centered around the various topics of cybersecurity, access control, identification, authentication, contingency planning, incident response, you, you know the, the big areas. But we didn't really have a whole lot more than that. Uh, and, and one of the things we started out doing initially is looking around and seeing how can we mature those, that cybersecurity questionnaire into more concrete security controls. And that 826 document really was the foundation, the starting point for 800-53. The risk management framework, we were working on that at the same time. In fact, the framework was developed initially to give a holistic life cycle view to cybersecurity. And one of our first big standards, FIPS 199 and FIPS 200, that categorization standard was critically important because the enormity of the federal government and our mission and the number and types of systems and the types of data that we were processing back then, processing, storing, and transmitting was enormous. So having a standard that allowed us to identify the most critical assets, that the categorization standard really required, and FISMA drove a lot of this, the legislation, developing a categorization for all systems and data, either in the low impact, moderate impact, or high impact. And the theory behind that standard was we couldn't protect everything. So let's figure out what our most important assets are and then the least important and then the things that were in the middle. And then we could develop specific safeguards or security controls that could be implemented to protect those particular assets. And obviously the higher the impact level, the more controls were applied and, and the rigor and the sophistication of those controls grew over time. Uh, that was the start of 853, and it grew over the years into a government-wide uh, guidance document. We established a partnership with the intelligence community and the Defense Department, and we made an offer to them they couldn't refuse. We said, well, you guys don't really need to have your own set of controls in the DOD and the intelligence community because we're all using the same technology. We're all part of the same federal government. Let's, let's give our contractors and our federal agencies a unified set of standards and guidelines to work from. And the intent was helping government and helping industry do a better job at uh, building, implementing, and maintaining these cybersecurity programs. That's kind of where it all started and just kind of grew from there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I can tell you, as someone who lived through that, you know, the the guidance that you put on on that, you know, at the time I was working at the Bureau of Diplomatic Security within Department of State, and I was our resident expert on going through that FIPS 199 exercise and categorizing major applications in general support systems that would then dictate, you know, the rigor of the 853 impact models, you know, to implement those controls. And I'll tell you, the foundation of my cybersecurity understanding was really based upon understanding what those requirements were. What are we trying to achieve, right? We're trying to minimize, you know, uh, the loss of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and then really focusing in on what we're doing. And then, you know, me going in and documenting all of those control descriptions and system security plans, it was a great foundation for someone just getting started in that, who then eventually moved to private industry and kind of took a lot of what I learned, um, uh, you know, from, you know, those uh, activities and exercises. So I think a, a collective thank you to you is, is warranted there. <laughs> well, thanks, for I appreciate that. I, I think the other thing that really came out of that, and there's been a lot of debate about FISMA and the NIST uh, standards and guidelines with respect to the risk management framework. Mm -hmm. Some people say they're too compliance focused, they're a checklist. But 
the, the framework, the RMF, risk management framework, and the control catalog was never intended to be a checklist. Right. In fact, it was just the opposite. We, from, the, from day one, we wanted to make sure that after you did the categorization of your data and your systems, you then had a, a starting set of controls. We call those the baselines. There's a recommendation from NIST on what control should I put into a moderate impact system to start with. But coupled with that was always the ability to tailor that baseline, which means you could take controls out. You could add additional controls based on your specific mission, your business model, your business case. And I think that illustrates a very important point that is still true today. Cybersecurity has some basic blocking and tackling that we all need to do, cyber hygiene, whatever you want to call it. But it doesn't end there because every organization has uh, different assets. They value their assets differently. They have critical missions. Everyone's got a critical mission business case, whether you're public or private sector. We need to have the ability to be agile, be flexible, because it's such a dynamic world that we live in. And I know companies like Zscaler and all the companies out there who are trying to provide cybersecurity technology, that flexibility and the ability to be agile and to design specific solutions for specific situations is critical. And I think that's what really makes the framework and the control catalog uh, so uh, uh, flexible and, and it's, it's lived this long because of that flexibility. Sure, sure. Yeah. And so on that note, with the flexibility of it, let's fast forward a little bit, you know, to uh, the advent of FedRAMP. And specifically, how did the 853 security control catalog impact or influence, you know, federal cloud uh, computing and federal cloud adoption? Well, that's, again, it was a very interesting time. This was circa, I believe, uh, 2010. Uh, that was when Vivek Kundra, our first federal CIO, mm -hmm. Uh, came on the scene and cloud computing. Uh, I don't know the exact year that cloud came on the scene, but it was around that time when things started getting really focused on cloud. A lot of people thought it was a buzzword at first. They didn't really understand what cloud was and, and there was a lot of misunderstanding, but NIST uh, at that point started to make some definitions. So uh, working with industry to try to define some of the cloud computing uh, concepts and techniques and principles that we needed to have to establish the protection that we needed to have when we start moving our data to the cloud. And again, cloud is another fantastic technology that allowed people to work in a more agile fashion, provisioning assets instead of owning everything. You can get provision, whether it's software as a service, platform as a service, or infrastructure. You now had control working with industry on how much computing power you needed, how many applications and how much storage. That's a great thing for efficiency and just making business better. And that's really been the, the, the secret to a lot of the efficiencies in our business community, all that, that technology making a more, a more efficient economy, a stronger economy. Well, back at that time, uh, the OMB, which is our uh, the organization that promotes and, and defines all the security policy for the federal government. Uh, they asked NIST to come to a meeting, and that was with Vet It was OMB. I think it was GSA back at the, in the day, around 2010, and I think DOD. And in fact, all the federal agencies eventually came into that working group, and they wanted to define some safeguards for cloud computing. And of course, since NIST is responsible for providing those standards and guidelines for the federal government, they decided to use the NIST standards and guidelines for cloud computing. That working group sat around a table, and I remember it was like it was yesterday. They said, if we're gonna do this for cloud computing, let's define, use the baselines, the low, moderate, high baselines. Let's just start with the low baseline and the moderate. And we'll define, uh, we'll take the moderate baseline, the low baseline that NIST is provided. And let's go around the table and have every agency say, is that good enough for you if you're going to put your data in the cloud? Mm -hmm. And there was a big debate. And there was a lot of arm wrestling. And after a few months, we ended up with a, a modified low and a modified moderate baseline that ended up being the foundation of the FedRAMP uh, cloud computing program. Now, I will say the other big driver at that time was related to the risk management framework. Mm -hmm. Every federal system had to be, it used to be called certification and accreditation. Mm -hmm. The RMF calls it assessment and authorization. They're two of our seven-step process. 
Now, every federal system had to be authorized for operation. That takes a lot of work. It's not cheap. It's expensive. Well, now what happens when we want to move that uh, to the cloud? Let's say, for example, now an agency is going to move its data uh, to one of the uh, major cloud providers. How can we be assured that cloud provider is providing the same protection that we would provide if that same data were sitting inside the fence line in a federal agency? Well, we had our controls now, and then we had to define a, an assessment part of that process. So that ended up being the, uh, the assessment part of the FedRAMP program where uh, the, the third-party providers would come in. They would assess the controls in a commercial cloud provider, and that would give the federal government the assurance that they needed that their data was safe in the cloud. But instead of having every federal agency require that assessment, they, want, they did it one time. And they said, look, let's do it one time, have the assessment, and make those assessment results available in the FedRAMP program to every federal agency. Mm -hmm. Now you've got economies of scale, and now you're saving a tremendous amount of resources by not having to assess each cloud provider for every customer that's coming in from the federal government. So it was a fantastic program. It took a long, a few years to get off the ground though, because yeah. there was a lot of hesitancy in going to the cloud. People have a tendency to think that they can always do a better job <laughs> on premise. Well, yeah. it turns out that that's not always the case. And <laughs> you all know that's very true. Sometimes you can, but a lot of times you don't have the resources. Uh, the skills are not always there. And the big cloud providers, and now almost every cloud provider that I've seen is really doing a fantastic job. So that's kind of how the, mm -hmm. the whole FedRAMP program unfolded. Sure. Yeah. You know, you, you just brought up something there that I, I didn't even contemplate, um, you know, you know, 15 plus years ago was, you know, I was responsible for leading the certification and accreditation efforts to get that authority to operate for a COTS product that, you know, my bureau was using. I can only imagine how many other agencies in the federal government were using that same COTS product and went through that same major application CNA cycle for largely the same implementation on premise. It's Absolutely. kind of interesting. I never thought about that, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, it's a, it, it's a very good point. In fact, that was the whole purpose of the common criteria. The international standard was to, in that same uh, vein, have commercial uh, product developers uh, come into get their products evaluated one time, and then the results go uh, are, are produced as part of a certificate, if you will. And then you could go to the website and say, well, this particular product could be an operating system, a network device has been evaluated and certified or validated. We use the term validation in this right. country. Mm -hmm. And that gives you confidence. It's all about, at the end of the day, it's all about having confidence in the technology that you're using, that it, it provides sufficient protection for whatever you might be doing. And this applies to federal government, private sector, academia. It's all the same technology. We're just all, um, we're, we're using this wonderful technology and there have been such great advances, but we still have a long way to go. And I think we'll, we'll probably get into some of those things later on. Sure. Yeah. Now, you know, kind of moving, I think, naturally into another standard that, uh, you know, I'm kind of curious to get your take on is, you know, the uh, the NIST 800-171, which was, you know, focused on the protection of uh, controlled unclassified information while residing on non-federal systems. Now, your, your focus, obviously, in the 853 was, you know, those federal information assets. How was this different in developing that standard, you know, understanding that now the, the focus, which I think was, was correct, is now kind of moving towards the federal supply chain? What were the biggest differences in the development of that standard? Well, I love this question because we're right in the middle of a call for information. We uh, were getting ready to update the 800 and also its companion document, 171 Alpha, mm -hmm. and a couple other publications that are tangentially related to that 171. It's, again, a very interesting story. We had, we had a huge breach of OPM. I think it was around 2015. And a year before that, we had started working with the DOD. They, they had been trying uh, to work with the defense industrial base, and they had been through several iterations of different numbers of security controls. So there's 25 or 75 controls coming out of 53. You know, maybe 25 wasn't enough, maybe 75 was too many. But when the executive order came out, uh, again, I think it was around 2010 timeframe, 
on controlled on class information. That was really the start of the whole movement toward getting a handle on federal information. We had so many different information types in the federal government. OOMB defined many of those in the early days. And a lot of those are reflected in one of our early publications, Aetner-60, volumes one and two. That was the uh, this, the guidance document that went, went with the FIPS 199 document and told you if you've got financial data at the moderate level of protection, here are the things you need to do. Well, when the executive order came out for, for CUI, it was very narrow in scope. The objective was to protect the confidentiality of this new information we we're calling controlled unclass information. And the National Archives and Records Administration was given the responsibility of being the executive agent. And so what they did, they had two objectives. One was to define a whole new set of CUI categories. And they even had subcategories initially. Those, those now have been all collapsed. I think there's 80 plus categories of information. And it could be contractor sensitive. It could be financial data. And the second part of their job was to define uh, safeguards for that, those new categories of information. And they did both of those. And again, they went back to the NIST standards and guidelines. They said, okay, all CUI is going to be protected at the minimum level of the moderate baseline controls, the mid-level. Anything below that, it wouldn't really be CUI. Anything above that um, may be classified, but that's under a whole other set of laws and things like that. So that's where we all started. Focused on confidentiality. And so the first thing we, we said, okay, we have the moderate baseline for the feds. They're already doing that. But this document now is concerned about the non-federal organizations. These would be contractors. Uh, they would be uh, academic institutions. Anybody that would have take possession of what we now call federal CUI. Mm-hmm. And again, we wanted to have the confidence that when we sent information to those entities, they would be protecting it just as we would on the federal side because information doesn't lose value just because it goes over the fence. So we had a choice. We could start with the moderate baseline and push all those controls out to the private sector, but that was not going to cut it because there were many controls in the moderate baseline that were not focused only on confidentiality because as you said earlier, Brad, we deal with confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Those are the three pillars of cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to take our own guidance here and we're going to tailor that moderate baseline. And we said, let's remove all controls that were not directly related to confidentiality. That was our first kind of pass at eliminating some of those controls from the moderate baseline. We then said, okay, if this is going to be directed at the private sector, let's take out all controls that are federally unique for example, the authorization process. And there's, there's many controls that are only applied in the feds. We mm-hmm. took all those out. And then the third tailoring uh, aspect, which is somewhat controversial, even to this day, is we said, let's take out controls that we just assume the private sector was going to be doing. For example, we have a whole family, uh, the Dash 1 controls, policy, procedures. Let's assume that any company out there today that's operating in the 21st century they know the basics. They're going to be doing a lot of those. So, so we, we tailored out all those controls that we, we assumed industry, private sector would be doing. Mm-hmm. And we ended up with a set of uh, requirements. Uh, they weren't called controls because they were actually drawn from the moderate baseline and FIPS 200, which was our very high level set of minimum requirements that we developed back in 2004. So we ended up calling them security requirements, and they ended up being initially 109 requirements that was a greatly pared down version of 853 moderate. We then added one more control or one more requirement, I should say, in the first revision, and it still stands today at 110 requirements. And that's kind of how it all evolved. And, And now we're in the process of updating that publication. So we'll see what industry thinks after all these years, and yeah. we're going to try yeah. to make some adjustments. Yeah, This is so interesting to me because you've just gone over 800-60, but yet at the same time, I don't know. First of all, I'm like, how do you keep all these numbers straight? 
<laughs> yeah, especially, especially, especially at my age, you know. Yeah. Oh my goodness, no! But you, I know you live this day in and day out. But but now, you know, looking at really this the eighty eight hundred dash one sixty, which is engineering trustworthy secure systems. How sure. do you? Can you give us a little bit insights into eighty dash one sixty and where that kind of came from? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this came along a little bit later. I, I believe it was around 2012. I've always been interested in security engineering. And the I, I kind of characterized the cybersecurity world as above the waterline and below the waterline. And, you know, if you think about the ocean or any kind of a body of water, there can be a lot of bad things that happen below the waterline, like sharks and uh, things like that. And I, I know that most of our work in cybersecurity, although um, our tech industry does build a lot of safeguards into the actual hardware, software, and firmware. But a lot of the things that we focused on, especially with certification accreditation or assessment authorization, RMF, to be honest, they focused above the waterline. That's what our customers can see in their organization. You can develop a contingency plan. You can develop an incident response plan. Uh, you can implement uh, multi-factor authentication. Uh, you can implement technologies that do encryption, encryption of data at rest, and all of those things. But let's be honest, below the waterline in the hardware, the software, and the firmware, we have very little visibility below the waterline as consumers. Now, industry, of course, does have a lot of visibility because they're the ones that design, develop, and build the technology. So one of the things that we uh, set out to do with 800-160 is let's, let's let's assume that we're going to be working in two worlds. The above the waterline cyber hygiene stuff needs to go on, basic blocking and tackling. But let's take a journey below the waterline. Let's try to define some what are now 40-year-old best practices on design, security engineering, concepts, principles, trusted systems design that really talk to the hardware, the software, and the firmware. A lot of, there's a lot of focus now in some recent executive orders on software assurance mm -hmm. and all the things that can really make a difference. I firmly believe that I think the vast majority of our cybersecurity problems would be solved if we could build better hardware, software, and firmware. In other words, it's putting the basic things into the technology that can help consumers do a better job above the waterline. And I've always used the analogy of an automobile. My first car, <laughs> many, many years ago, probably 55 or, oh yeah, 55 years ago, I think my first car, barely had a seatbelt. And then I remember my first new car I bought, uh, an airbag was offered, but it was an option. And then through a combination of the automobile industry wanting to build safer automobiles for their customers and some government regulation, they kind of work together. You've seen the evolution of automobile safety to what we have today, where you have seat belts, you have uh, airbags, you have steel reinforced doors, you have engine compartments that drop down, you have a whole series of sensor devices that keep people like me from changing lanes when I shouldn't. And that is an evolution that I would love to see us emulate in the world of cybersecurity. And uh, again, customers are never going to be expected to understand the technology. They shouldn't have to. But industry, working with government collectively, uh, we should be able to design um, a, a, some kind of a paradigm where we give our consumers greater information on what is actually going on below the waterline. Because right now, people buy the technology. They don't mm -hmm. have a clue what's going on. Now, there's some things going on at NIST with the security labeling uh, project where, you know, through implementing better software development techniques, secure coding techniques. Vendors now can, can make statements and maybe provide evidence that they've done best practices. And that, what does that do? It gives customers greater confidence and that fuels the industry. We all want to buy the technology, but we want to make sure that what we're buying is safe and effective and as secure as it can be. So the 80160 is bringing back 40 years of best practices and design principles. And again, I look at it as a resource for systems engineers. We've also changed the focus from security engineering to systems engineering. Mm -hmm. And why do we do that? Because 
systems engineers are the one, those are the folks that build everything. Mm -hmm. The security stuff, in fact, I believe this has been an impediment. We have put security in a stovepipe for the last 40 years. And we have to bring it out of the stovepipe and say, look it, we've got some knowledge and skills and abilities, but let's bring our security stuff to the engineer's house. Let's work side by side with them to advise them how they can build better software. And, and better software means fewer weaknesses and fewer deficiencies. And that means fewer vulnerabilities to pass on to the consumer. So, Brad, when you were back in the federal government, mm-hmm. you didn't get stuck with a thousand vulnerabilities right. that you've got to put on a list and categorize and never hope to get those things all taken care of. That's the whole right. objective of 8160. Right, right. And I, I mean, I, I'm having an aha moment over here because, it, you know, I think that we understand that risk is temporal. You know, decisions that we make, you know, today affect risk tomorrow, next week, and in 20 years. I mean, we got to look no further than Spectre and Meltdown to see how those came back and impacted us from something that was engineered two, three decades previously. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the focus of the 800 160 is really on you know, our software and our our solution providers out there to just be better with their development in, in one area for me that I think is important, where we're making it ubiquitously and economically irrational for somebody to attack. And I'm saying that thinking of solar winds in Kaiseya specifically. Is that really the focus of it, the, the vendor space out there? That's exactly the focus. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the, the concepts, I think I've said this a lot in the past, when you look at, I believe, our, the greatest threat to our systems today and our, our information and our organizations is complexity. Mm-hmm. We're living through the greatest technology revolution in history. And the technology is so unbelievably powerful, robust. We all want to purchase things, but that every time we bring a new technology in, it's a dynamic world, new people, new processes, new technologies, new applications. That complexity starts to build on top of each other until you don't really understand what you've deployed. And one of the the fundamental principles in cybersecurity is going back as far as I can remember, least functionality, least privilege. Those things are very simple concepts, but we violate those almost every day. And, you know, this idea of deploying in at least functionality, only the ports, protocol, services, applications, and things you need to accomplish the mission. Mm -hmm. We, We don't really pay a lot of attention to that today because I believe we become a little bit addicted to the technology. It's just so compelling. And, you know, we've got to get better at looking at our assets, determining what's critical, what's not, what's not so critical. And we talk a lot about this in 8160, doing an asset evaluation and criticality analysis first, and then engineering solutions that allow you to bring in as many safeguards as you need to protect those critical assets. You almost have to assume that the adversaries can do almost anything that they wanna do today. There's there's almost nothing you can't do with a computer sitting 5,000 miles away. The question is how much defense and depth can we bring to this this fight? And it it is a risk issue. You know, we we talk about, and I know Zscatter has been involved in zero trust and things like that. We, We now assume the adversary is inside the perimeter. That wasn't assumed even a decade ago. Mm-hmm. We, our, our, our strategy was penetration resistance. Right. Stop the bad guys at the boundary. Well, we know that worked. Let's even be generous. Let's say it worked 90% of the time, which I still don't believe. Right. But what about the 10% or 20% when it doesn't work? Well, now they're inside the perimeter. What are, we, what are you going to do? Well, that's where the 8160 is to find a multi-dimension protection strategy. Keep doing dimension one, stop them at the boundary, penetration resistance. But dimension two is called damage limitation. That's where you get inside the architecture. Now you start to increase, try to increase the adversary's work factor. I I equate it to your house. If the bad guys get through the lock on your front door, which they can do fairly easily, can they come into every room in your house and ransack and steal all your valuables? Or what if you had a, a vault or a safe in every room in your house. Now the bad guys got to get into every one of those are like security domains within your system. Mm -hmm. That's the whole kind of strategy of zero trust. You shrink that perimeter down to smaller domains and you still apply safeguards like access control, authorization, 
uh, and all the things that you would do normally, but it's in a very dynamic environment and you're checking privileges, you're implementing least functionality, least, least privilege on smaller and smaller resources. That has a net effect of increasing the adversary's work factor. And if you combine that with some of the new container technology and, and um, segmentation, micro segmentation, breaking mm -hmm. things up in smaller pieces, virtualization and micro virtualization where you're churning the infrastructure at a very rapid rate. So now you combine that increased work factor with limiting the adversary's time on target. That's what technology can do for us. And I can see the day when we're not gonna have to worry every day about what new threats coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. Let them throw whatever they want at us because if they get inside the perimeter, we now have damage limitation through those two things I just mentioned. And we can move ourselves into the third dimension of system and cyber resiliency. That's the ultimate goal we like to get to. It's like a daily basis. I have a conversation about we have to unwind the complexities of what we've built over the years, right? In order to simplify, understand your band-aids, because let's face it, in a lot of instances, it's making you vulnerable. But then you're able to enhance your security posture. You're able to, to your point, Ron, break it down into chunks that you, you can actually protect in a different manner in which you do today. We, we used to have a joke. I worked back at the NSA. My, my first cybersecurity assignment back in 1990 was at the National Security Agency. I, I really enjoyed that assignment. I learned a tremendous amount back. That was over 32 years ago now. And I remember one of the folks I worked with had a, uh, had a saying. He called it a trusted garage door opener. He said, this garage door opener does one thing. It opens up and closes your garage, but it does it with a high degree of assurance. It's bulletproof. Right. Right. And of course, that's a simple example. A lot of our technology is way too complicated to get to that point. But I do believe there is some wisdom in going, that's what the thin clients were all about. You know, you mm -hmm. kind of reduce that attack surface down to something you understand, and then you apply what you know to that smaller attack surface um, or as I think uh, some people call it a protect surface now, you're, it's the same idea. You know, you're trying to get a smaller surface to protect, giving the adversary fewer opportunities to do damage. And then you're bringing your A game, which is not perfect. You know, our A, our a game is our A game, but it's not perfect. But through things like defense in depth and applying those design principles that we talked about in 8160, and again, we've got 30 design principles you don't apply all of them, but you can apply which ones you need to make that system and that data as secure as it needs to be. And that's really the key point. Mm -hmm. Every mission is different. And sometimes you're going to work a lot harder and spend a lot more money on protecting assets that are that much more valuable. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, that's just the paradigm that uh, we live in today. You can't protect everything. and You've got to understand what's valuable and what's not. You know, it's so interesting. We've, we've had so much conversation around things that you have helped us define and understand. So let's talk a little bit about the future. So what's in view for you and what's in sight that you're working on now that you could maybe share with us? Well, I got a couple of things going on right now. Um, we're, we're actually producing the final publication of our update to 800-160. It's volume one, revision one. And we've been working on this for probably a good year and a half now. I've got a great team and that's going to be out in September. And that will be the uh, second update of our engineering series. We updated 800 volume two uh, about a year ago or a little over a year ago. That's on cyber resiliency, how to build cyber resilient systems. And that's once we get these two things done, then, then I think the engineering guidelines are going to be in pretty good shape for a while. The next thing we want to do is take all of the guidance that we published in 800-160 volume one and determine how does that apply to DevSecOps, the DevSecOps world. You know, the, the software development community now with DevOps and agile development, and this is the way we roll now as an industry out there. You know, they're, they're producing software and solutions very rapidly through the agile development technologies in the DevOps world. Now we have DevSecOps where we're trying to inject security into that rapid development process. And it's not just about the classic security 
safeguards and countermeasures that we talked about for years. It's about working with software engineers early in the life cycle. So as they produce that code very quickly, they can understand where the weaknesses and deficiencies are and fix those things before they become vulnerabilities. So you're trying to work with the engineers early in the life cycle to make sure you do the best job you can of producing the best solutions that come out the other end for customers. So one of the things we're trying to understand is what of those 30 design principles in 8160, all of those design concepts and principles for trusted systems, how many of those things are being done now in the DevSecOps world? There's a lot of DevSecOps work going on. I'd like to see what they're actually doing Maybe they've got it all covered. Maybe they're missing a few things. And we'd like to be able to work collaboratively with industry to see where we are. It's a, it's a real research and development type activity. But I think it's going to be very instructive. Either we'll find out that we're a little short on where we need to be, or maybe we're okay. And that's, the, that's what science is all about. You, you go in with an open mind, and you try to come up with the best solutions you can. Yeah. Um, the other big thing is 800 I mentioned that earlier. We've got a call for information out. Over the next 18 months, we're going to be updating 800 800-171 alpha, and most likely 800-172 and 800-172 alpha. Those are the enhanced security requirements for controlled on class information, largely used for the really high-end systems and applications in the DOD and the defense industrial base where you're dealing, uh, you're up against nation state level adversaries. And the 800 may not always be strong enough to protect those kind of assets that are at the real high end against very sophisticated, well-resourced adversaries. So that, that's a full plate for me for the next uh, year or two. And then from there, uh, I don't know, uh, we'll just, I just, like I said before, I just love the job. I enjoy getting yeah. up every day and trying to do something to help the country uh, be more secure. Wow, that is a lot going on for you. Yeah. So, you know, to kind of conclude today, Ron, you actually just said something there that I think will will tie nicely here. And, you know, not just what you're actively working on. And I know the question gets asked to a lot of us in this field, you know, what keeps us up at night? But let's flip that around. And what what do you see that we're doing right within the industry writ large with some of these initiatives that get you up in the morning saying, you know, that's an incredibly promising initiative. I can't wait to see where that goes. Yeah, that, again, it's such a good question. I, I think that it's very easy to get discouraged in, in the field of cybersecurity. Uh, I've known literally hundreds of CISOs and people who get up every day, and not just CISOs, but all the wonderful people in the cybersecurity business, no matter what you do, whether it's policy, firewall development, encryption, uh, you know, where you are, everybody gets up every day and they're trying to do whatever they can to make things better. And like I say, sometimes it can be discouraging because, you know, the adversary can throw something at you. You didn't, that, that 90 mile an hour fastball, you know, just comes whizzing by and you just miss it. And sometimes we blame the wrong people. You know, we, the life expectancy for CISOs and Security professionals is not as long as we'd like because it, it's a high pressure job, a lot of pressure. And, and we put too much on those people without giving them always the best solutions that they can use to perform their jobs to the, to the top of their ability. And so, like I say, in the last 32 years that I've been doing this, I've seen enormous advances where there was a the common criteria, the FISMA the cybersecurity framework, the advances in encryption technology from going from the DES standard to the AES and now the quantum cryptography. We've got a we've we've come a long way, but the adversaries have come a long way too. Mm-hmm. They've got a lot of technology now. They have a lot of resource they're throwing at us. And as I said before, complexity is really our biggest enemy, our biggest threat now, because that can be a showstopper. So I think what I see on, the, as the, on the, the bright spots is we've had some recent legislation, executive orders, and just the industry moving to some new focus areas, I call, getting below the waterline and re-architecting some things. The zero trust strategy that uh, my colleague John Kinderweg talks about, going below the waterline and looking at the architecture and trying some new things that we haven't done before. I talked about segmentation, micro-segmentation, virtualization, bringing all those things 
damage limitation. That's a different strategy. And you can't really ever hope to win the fight with just good tactics. You've got to have a good strategy at the top level, whether that's zero trust or whether it's a larger strategy uh, that you employ, an architectural strategy. And from there, the tactics will follow. And when you've got that marrying up of a great strategy, great tactics fueled by great technology, and I believe, we didn't talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, but you've got a lot of scanning tools now that are next-gen scanning tools. You put all those things together and you put a, um, the overarching paradigm of how our country is put together, where we have government and industry and academia working together. I go back to one of the things that inspired me from er the early days when I was 10 years old. Is, was I'm a huge NASA fan and I'm a huge NASCAR fan and I love them for different reasons. But NASA, I remember when we we're in that uh, race to the moon. And President Kennedy had that very famous speech. You know, we're gonna go to the moon and do other things before the end of the decade. That was back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. He said, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And that was a call to action to the best and the brightest of the American people. To me, it was the best example of bringing together government, industry, and academia. NASA was born, and in eight short years, Hard to believe. We can't even do multi-factor authentication in 15 years. We put a man on the moon in less than eight years, 1969, July the 20th, a great day. I believe we have that kind of a renaissance coming in the cybersecurity area as we move our business of cybersecurity into the world of engineering. And, and we capitalize on all of the, the maybe 100 years of engineering to, you know, his expertise and skills and technology and we bring our cyber security skills and technologies into that world. That's what really excites me every day. And I'm always optimistic. I'm bullish on the future of cybersecurity, on security engineering, and about the technology in general, because I think that technology fuels the United States. It gives us a stronger economy, and it gives us our national security. They're both important. And again, I want to just thank you guys for doing this today and uh, give me a platform to talk about some of my favorite things. No, oh, no, thank you. And with that, what, a, what an awesome way to wrap up here our, our time with you. Again, thank you so much for the contributions you have made, not only to our military, to our protecting of the government, to the going ahead and helping the private sector go ahead and figure out how to secure themselves in a manner in which is viable and doable. So thank you so much for the time you spent with us. And Brad, to you, thanks, Mr. Co-host. I appreciate yeah. uh, you hey, yeah, being they, here with me. I, I, you know, this is going to be a tough episode to one, one up. I, I mean, what a fantastic dialogue. I really appreciate the time, Ron. It's been very enlightening. Thank and you very much for listeners. having me. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And to all of our listeners, we'll see you again on another episode of Cloudy with a Chance of Trust. Take care. For listening to Cloudy with a Chance of Trust. Check back with your podcast provider regularly for more episodes. You can find Lisa Lorenzen and Pam Kubiatowski on the CXO Revolutionaries website at revolutionaries.zscaler.com or on LinkedIn. Statements by Zscaler podcasters and guests are informational only and should never be construed as legal advice. You should consult with your legal advisor on matters related to you or your business. Zscaler makes no warranties, express, implied, or statutory as to the content of this podcast, and it is provided as is. Content on this podcast may contain forward-looking statements that are current as of the date of recording and subject to change. These statements are subject to the safe harbor provisions created by the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Full legal disclaimers are available at revolutionaries.zscaler.com. Copyright 2022.